Good evening again, everyone. Welcome to the Eric Russell Show, the postseason edition, and we are, um, well, the post-regular um, season edition, I guess we should say, Eric. Have another beautiful day for football, and again, we're facing another all-time team over here. Bill, it's amazing. Last week we faced the all-time leading passer to Southern Conference history, and uh, Schultz, uh, their fine quarterback, has close to 9,500 yards uh, passing, which is more than, than Gregory had last week. They have a host of fine receivers. They've got a big offensive line, and they protect Schultz very well, and we're going to have the same kind of problems with our defense uh, getting to their passer as we had last week. I hope our coaches have found a way to get there because if we're to win this game, that's exactly what's going to have to happen. I understand that uh, we're worried a little bit about Taz Dixon's knee. Yeah, we're worried a lot about it, but Taz has willed himself well for this game, and that means a lot. He really wants to play, and he's going to play, and hopefully it'll hold up for him. We'd heard that they had maybe a, an injury or two over there. Now, I'm not aware of that. Their quarterback hurt his shoulder a little bit last week against Boston U, but uh, in the second half, he threw the ball 40 and 45 yards, and it didn't seem to be bothering him very much. <laughs> now, usually they say that this round of the playoffs is the most dangerous. Um, teams like, uh, like Villanova can sneak in and, and do wonders on the big boys. Well, we, in 85, we had a situation very similar to theirs. We had never been in a playoff before, and played an upper level team in Jackson State and managed to win the first game. As, as far as the degree of danger is concerned in the playoffs, if you win, you get to play one more time, and if you don't win, you get to go home. So it's dangerous as the devil, first round or whenever. But we're awfully concerned about uh, the fact that Villanova has a fine football team, and I hope our guys can play well today and win the game. Well, they've never faced a triple option, and that could be a factor, too. Boy, I hope it will. I hope they've had a hard time preparing for it. Uh, they haven't played anybody who runs an option for a living like we do. They've, they've played some that, that run it some, but uh, not as a basic offense. We found that it's, it's difficult uh, to prepare in the two or three days allotted for an offense like that. On the other hand, uh, they may have some experts on their staff over there who deploy their people just right, and they could stop it. I hope not. I hope not either. Well, good luck today, and we want to knock them dead and do it one more time. One more time, Bill, and I'll see you later. All right, we'll see you with the first half highlights right after we hear from the folks who help pay the bills around here. <laughs> These scenarios seem completely out of sync. Villanova won the toss and elected to take the ball. And so they did. They darn near took it all the way. As Scott Thompson broke to the outside, got as far as midfield before the kicker of all people, David Kuhl, dragged him down. But a personal foul found them starting from their own 35 instead. And at first, the Wildcats looked as if they no more belonged in Paulson Stadium than a harness racer. This razzle-dazzle deal on first down found Robert Brady getting the ball in a reverse, and thanks to tremendous pressure by Michael Brady, tossed up a wounded duck that was way too short. Georgia Southern's first play, on the other hand, was quite a contrast. A pitch back to Ernest Thompson from Raymond Gross, and it was bombs away to Terrence Sorrell, who hauled it in 61 yards downfield at the Villanova 11. What a surprise, and what a play. Well, I'll tell you, we, uh, we've been practicing all week, and... Um, Coach told me the day before the game that uh, we were going to throw it. I didn't realize we were going to throw the first player of the game, but uh, <laughs> we, he called it, and uh, we were able to execute it, and uh, it was just a good catch by uh, Terrence, and uh, Raymond threw a good block for me there also um, for me to throw the ball, and uh, it's just a play we executed, and we've been saving it all year, and uh, it worked for us. It's a big play for us. We practiced it every day, and uh, Coach Venuto told me before the game that he was going to run that first play, so I'm quite sure it caught everybody by surprise. <laughs> Did, uh, it, of course, Ernest put through an absolutely perfect yeah, pass. Beautiful, there. beautiful pass, <laughs> right in stride. Yeah. yeah, that's worked uh, pretty pretty well when we've done it, you know, on occasion, and, uh, you know, we have big plays happen from it. A couple of years ago, Tony Belson caught a touchdown in East Carolina, and, uh, you know, today, Grip got it down to, what, the one-yard line, so... You know, it's a big play, and, uh, you know, when it works, it really works. Right. Carl Miller nearly punched it in for us on the next play, taking Raymond's pitch on the left corner and getting to the one. 
Ernest Thompson had a hand in the scoring, too, as he sliced off right guard on the next play for the final yard and a 7-0 lead right after Mike Dowis extra point. The defense continued to make it look like the Wildcats were in for a long afternoon as Daryl Hendricks and Mike West held a meeting with Kirk Schultz, eight yards behind the line of scrimmage. That brought up third and 15, and no better luck either on the next play as Charlie Waller hit John Caroli initially while Hendricks and West came in to finish the job. And once again, Southern had the ball back, and everything seemed like peaches and cream. Joe Ross began another spectacular afternoon darting off the right side for 16 yards up to midfield. But just when it looked like the Eagle Express was rolling, Ernest Thompson was derailed. The ball came loose, and the Cats were in business at their own 32. The Wildcats appeared to be on their way to knotting it up 7-all as Kirk Schultz moved them methodically through the Eagle defense. This pass to Tom Colombo netted five yards down to the Southern 42. But two plays later, the Wildcats lost control as number 94, Tim Brown, stripped John Caroli of the football. It was Southern's, but who got it? And as they finally untangled, number 22, Taz Dixon, popped out of the pile with his trophy. The Eagle Express showed signs of coming to life then as Ross turned the left corner for 16 yards into Villanova territory, down to their 45. Then things began to mess up the plans. At the end of a Raymond Gross scramble for seven-yard gain, notice the yellow hanky at the end of the line. Southern was penalized 15 yards for clipping. Still, it looked like it was going to be Southern's day. As Raymond went back to pass, it was batted in the air and caught by offensive lineman Sean Ganey? Not even Ripley would have believed it. Sean, your first career reception, was it? Oh, yeah, it was my first one, and hopefully it's not my last one. <laughs> You're going up and maybe split tackle or something? Or something? Uh, I'll stay guard, but we can devise a play where we can get me the ball more because I think I need the ball. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, still, you, you do work on that, don't you? A little tip uh, drills and things like that? Yeah, we work on tip drills between the offensive line when every week on Thursdays we go down there and we'll line one-on-one -on -one with one of the defensive players, and we'll practice going out for passes and beating each other along. And, ball tipped up and I saw it and grabbed it. <laughs> that unfortunately was about the end of the line for this run of the Eagle Express and Terry Harbin came in to punt the Cats into a hole. Beautiful punt combined with great coverage by number 44 Shane Maxwell who skinned this cat at the five. We had him right where we wanted him. But Kirk Schultz was about to give the Eagles and their followers a graduate course in reality. I.e. there's no such thing as being in a hole with Schultz at the helm. On third and two, he hit fullback Jeff Johnson for 15 yards up to the VU 29, and three plays later, Schultz made it look so frighteningly easy it would have scared Freddy Krueger. As Schultz put a feather-touch spiral rainbow out to wide open Tom Colombo, and though Kevin Whitley nipped at his ankles, it was far too late. And the few faithful who'd come from Philly were beginning to enjoy themselves a bit more with the score tied 7-7 at the end of the first quarter. Then a funny thing happened to Villanova on their way to running back a Terry Harbin punt. Robert Brady was sailing right along with what looked like a return for a touchdown for sure. When with no one near him, he decided to change hands and oops a daisy dropped the football. And Jim Mutimer, thinking Christmas was a month early, curled around it at the 29. That eventually led to a Mike Dowis field goal and a 10-7 lead, which lasted just about as long as the guarantee on a used toaster because on the kickoff, coverage was, shall we say, about as much help as a high wind in a prairie fire. Scott Thompson took the short kick at the 14 and ran it back 50 yards to our 38 before Randall Boone could bring these proceedings to a halt. From there, Herr Schultz plucked eagle feathers to his heart's content to Thompson for 20 yards to the GSC 15. And Jeff Johnson on another of those float-like-a-feather, sting-like-a-bee deals it was 14 to 10 Nova. But if Wildcat fans like that, they love this. After forcing Southern to punt again and operating from their own 11, Schultz, just to prove that it ain't no fluke he's passed for more real estate than Donald Trump, drops the bomb to Robert Brady, who is finally run down inside the one by Randall Boone again. It only delayed the inevitable, however, by one play as Kirk, on first and goal, took it in at right guard. And the scoreboard was suddenly looking, to say the least, ominous. 
Late in the half, another promising drive finally stalled, and Mike Dowis came in to trim the Wildcats' lead to eight with a half minute to go before intermission. And we'll be back to talk with the author of this drama, Kirk Schultz, and his coach, Andy Talley, after this timeout. He was, to say the very least, sensational. Adjectives don't seem to be enough to describe the poise and accuracy of Kirk Schultz. He's a, a fine player, and we're going to miss him. He's, you know, thrown over 70 career touchdowns, and, you know, he's been with us for five years and really all, knows the offense really better than we do, and we're going to miss Kirk. I think a lot of pro uh, teams are interested in him, and I hope he has a shot. He, you know, we came to play, and I, I think that we, we showed people around, you know, the country that we can play, and, uh, you know, we came up a little short. You know, they were a superior team, but I think we played hard. You scared the daylights out of this crowd, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed that. You know, I, I think we did a good job with our passing game today. The coaches had an excellent game plan put together. And, uh, you know, they seemed to want to run man-to-man -man with you, and we feel we had some excellent receivers and just get some maximum protections going and throw the ball up. He was just the most poorest quarterback we've played, I think, and he didn't get worried. He'd sit in the pocket, and if his first couple of slides were covered, he didn't panic. You know, he just looked all over the field. And, and you know, that's tough for a quarterback to sit there and know he's going to get hit and still throw it. But... Uh, I just have to give all that credit to him. You know, he just, he sat back there and, and, and knew what he had to do, and he got the job done. He was a good quarterback because he had a nice touch, you know. Mm -hmm. And he fooled me a couple times. He got one for a touchdown. Uh, but uh, he was a good quarterback. And such a great career here at uh, Mid Villanova and uh, with the restarting of the football program, and you've laid a good foundation for these people. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's a real honor to be the first quarterback, you know, back in a program and, and get him back on our feet. And I think that people around, you know, the country will see it. You know, now we're you know a national powerhouse, but we're there. You know, we're going to make the playoffs, and and we did ourselves justice down here in Georgia against you know a hostile crowd and a, and a tough team. Yeah, you sure did. And uh, I hope uh, you got any pro aspirations, Kirk. Well, you know, if if, if it comes along, I'll I'll take the opportunity and see how it goes. A class act, and Kirk, we hope it goes well. Say, would you like to come to Atlanta? Second half highlights after this. Through much of the third quarter, the weather looked foreboding. The sky was gray, and Carl Miller took the opening kickoff and was promptly injured. A gluteal bruise kept him out the rest of the game. But Raymond Gross got the spark going with a sensational 28-yard run, just simply refusing to go down. He finally was knocked out of bounds at the enemy 32. But what great second, third, and fourth effort. Again, the Eagle Express was shut down, however, and Mike Dowis' 30-yarder was his fourth field goal of the afternoon. But now, GSC was within five. Nevertheless, the Eagle record of giving up no points in the third quarter was in serious jeopardy with a guy like Schultz at the helm. Could this turn into the gridiron version of the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald? Gloomy skies and eerie wind. Fortunately, Gordon Lightfoot will never have to balladize this one. Daryl Hendricks and company had something to say on the matter. They forced Villanova to attempt a 35-yard field goal when on third and one, Hendricks shot the gap and dropped Jeff Johnson for a three-yard loss. What they did a good job with with, uh, with our running game, they, they shot our running game down pretty well. You know, we were only getting about three yards a pop, and now uh, we're usually getting about four or five yards and, and keeping on schedule. So we had to rely a little bit on our pass game. And fortunately, you know, they didn't want to zone up. They wanted to stay man with us, and, and uh, I think that our receivers are good enough to, to handle that. What wasn't good enough was their field goal attempt. Suddenly, the sun broke through the clouds, and Thomas Witka's attempt from only 35 yards away sailed wide to the right. How about that? That was, uh, that was really a good break for us because we had, we had a pretty good drive the first time we got the ball, and darn if they didn't come back and, and miss that field goal. That would have uh, evened things up for them. We got a field goal, and they would have got it back, but they missed. And then good things started happening. Well, you know, I think that was a big play. It kind of gave us the momentum, you know, to go ahead and take it down and get it into the end zone. And, you know, it was a big play. And I think, uh, you know, that kind of pushed the momentum more our way. Boy, is that the understatement of the season. As Southern began the go-ahead drive, Raymond with the connection to Terrence Sorrell for 33 spectacular yards that knocked our camera out of focus. By this time, Joe Ross had his diesel revved up to touchdown speed, and this 27-yard freight train carry down the left sidelines got us all the way to the 12. Now watch two plays hence as Joe gets outside somehow and goes all the way to the three, in the process knocking defensive back Chuck Murray halfway back to Pennsylvania. 
we knew we'd have trouble with their option, and, and we certainly did. We tried to take the fullback away and the quarterback, and we were successful at doing that. But uh, we couldn't take the pitch man down. We just couldn't get to the pitch man. And then when we turned the ball over, you know, and gave the ball back to their offense, our defense was on the field too much. We needed to control the ball more. But, uh, you know, third quarter was key. We knew that they traditionally come back hard in the third quarter, and they certainly did. And uh, it was just a, it was a great experience for us. You know, we've only been around for five years. And uh, we hope that, you know, we'll pattern ourselves after what Georgia Southern's doing, and hopefully we'll be back next year. Then, thanks to an official with a whistle faster than Grease Lightning, Ernest Thompson didn't get credit for this touchdown. They say, as we watch it again from up top, that his forward progress was stopped at the one. Uh -huh. Oh, well, he had the vote and we didn't. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Only God's green earth stopped E.T. the next time, and that part of the ground happened to be in the end zone. 22-21. Mathematically, the two-point conversion was the only way to go, and following superb blocking behind Brad Bernard and Sean Ganey, Joe Ross was in like Flynn, and suddenly the scoreboard didn't seem quite so ominous anymore. Then the floodgates opened. Schultz pass ricocheted off the intended receiver's helmet, and Michael Berry picked it out of the sky. Uh, take my word for it. There he is. Michael got it to the 23. And two plays later, Joe Ross sliced off left guard and went untouched 11 yards to glory. I think maybe the key play, the one that kind of got me over the hump anyway, was the deflection. And I think by Busoletti, although I'm not real sure, and caught by Michael Berry and run back close and and we got a touchdown out of that, and we're off and running. But it's Joe Ross running the last two weeks that's been so great. As a reporter from the Augusta Chronicle said in the press box, Joe Ross might be the first fullback in history to block for himself. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Uh, we just, I think we just played hard. We really had to come out and really, I think we kind of underestimated this team at first. And then once we felt them out, figured out what we had to do. We just came out and just started playing hard and doing whatever it took, you know, to win. Yeah. They said that they had really a lot of trouble stopping us on the corners. They knew that that was going to be the big problem if we got the option going. Yeah, true, because I think they made up their mind they're going to stop the fullback. And if you just make up your mind what you're going to do, that leaves one just obviously open, and that's the corner. Yeah. And, the, and you were you were making some good yardage on those corners today. Well, true. They put me out there also, and that's where I think I like it best, <laughs> out in the corner. I do real well out there. Just, you know, everybody just played well second half. Things were never broken wide open against these guys, but the final play of the third period came close. A little flare pass out to Daryl Hopkins that developed too quickly for the Wildcats to react, and Daryl split the defense and was long gone. Southern by 17. At halftime, I had no reason to believe that we would come back and outscore them 42-7 uh, to 7 over a stretch of about 20, 25 minutes in the second half. But we did the shades of last week. Um, I don't know why we start slowly and play so hard in the third quarter. But uh, until something better comes along, we'll take it. <laughs> what we didn't want to take was more points from Villanova, but Kirk Schultz and his Yankee buddies had other ideas. A sure TD pass on this play was broken up beautifully by Rodney Oglesby, but Schultz wouldn't be denied. Hitting Scott Thompson in the back of the Eagle Nest, shaving the GSC advantage to 10, was still 10 and a half long minutes to play. What we will take are interceptions, and after forcing the Eagles to punt again, the Wildcats ran one play. Schultz tried the bomb, but Randall Boone defused this baby and returned it 10 yards to boot. On the next play, Joe Ross was the midnight train through Georgia for 39 more of his 190 yards to pay dirt. And when Jason Whitehead was dumb enough to get in the way, kaboom. And then Schultz continued to go to the well once too often. Rodney Oglesby was the only guy who had a chance to catch this one. It was right at him. And 32 yards later, Southern was up 52 to 28. Yeah, he sort of threw that one right to me. <laughs> I was just standing there waiting for it, like a you know innocent bystander. He sort of threw it straight into my hand. So if I would have dropped that one, I don't think I would ever live that one down. It was um, it came at a good time, and I'm just glad that I was able to contribute at that time. Even though it didn't make any difference in the outcome, Nova scored late in the contest, and that didn't sit well with the Georgia Southern defense. We got a lot of work to do. You know, we've given up a lot of points the last two weeks, and we can't do that all year. But you're right; they did have a great quarterback, and so did last week. So. Maybe next week's opponent won't. I like it. You got a great passer like that and great receivers like they got, you know. 
Brady was good, but you got, you know, the other two guys were real good too. And the 83 yard touchdown, you know, kind of got us down. But you got something we got to do is just get back up, you know, and take it as it comes. And as long as we are able to do that, we'll be all right, I believe. When you I feel like our defense, other than those big plays, really just stopped them, mm -hmm. you know, except for a couple third down plays. But uh, we, uh, I'm just happy for the win, <laughs> you know. Regardless of what went on and who did what, and we, you know, 12 and 0 is uh, we're still in it. So I'm just grateful for that. We'll second that emotion, and Irk will be back with final comments in a moment. Well, the Villanova game is history, and uh, Irk, I don't know why I was worried, but doggone it, I was worried. Bill, I was really worried too at halftime. We had shown no inclination to slow them down. We had swapped field goals uh, for touchdowns, and that's not a very good swap. We started out playing really, really well. Uh, scored in a hurry, got the ball back, um, had a good drive going. We fumbled, and from that point until, gosh, really the end of the first half, we made a lot of real dumb mistakes and uh, mental errors, had some penalties that we shouldn't have gotten. Just things that good football teams don't hurt themselves with. Schultz is pretty good, though. He really is. Um, so is Brady, number eight. Um, they throw it and catch it very well, and their offensive line provides super protection. We were hard-pressed to get to their passer with our four rush. Uh, we had to match up man-to-man -man and blitz, and I think that was probably the best thing we did throughout the game. We sacked quarterback two or three times off that, we at least made some things happen. And uh, gosh, thank, thank goodness we were able to do that. Um, an interception for a touchdown uh, always makes things easier. But gosh, I really didn't feel all that great with three minutes left to play because they would get it and they'd come back down the field. They made a couple fourth down plays, made a lot of third down plays. Um, greatly to our guys' credit, uh, they were able to, to hang on and our offense was able to score points, and then our defense scored points. Uh, 52 is more than 36, and we'll take it every time. Okay, whoever we play next week, I'm glad we're playing again. Boy, I am too. That's all we've ever asked, Bill, is an opportunity to play one more time, and darn if we don't have it. And I look forward to seeing you right here against whoever it is. Okay, next week. See you then. All right, sir. And we'll see you next week as well with the highlights of that game, too, from Paulson Stadium. Good night.